Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Uh, on behalf of the Plymouth County DA's office and our Diversity and Inclusion Committee, I'm pleased to welcome everybody here to today's event. Uh, the members of our Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which is co-chaired by Min Tram Tran and Maria DeCanto, uh, they worked really hard to put this up uh, together. I want to thank them very much for doing that, uh, as well as for the beautiful display uh, that we have later on, we have in the main lobby, as we've been going around for the last few months and talking about the Liberty Tree, uh, Min has been taking that around uh, to various spots. And it's been great because people have been able to see it's right here, right now, there it is. Uh, but it's been moving, it's been traveling uh, quite a bit, so that's been really good. Uh, but the, the star of today's event is certainly not me. Uh, it's our esteemed and our accomplished guest speaker. And we're really fortunate to once again uh, be joined today by noted Brockton educator and historian Professor Willie Wilson, Jr. And once again, he has graciously offered his time uh, and his, his wisdom to prepare in a, a, the informative talks that are really necessary that we're going to have an opportunity to hear about Brockton's famous Liberty Tree. Uh, it's an extraordinarily significant landmark. It's not that far from here. It wasn't that far from here. Uh, and uh, it's right here in downtown Brockton. And a lot of people don't know that. So uh, I, I, we've talked about it a little bit at various events. I thought it would be important to once again ask the professor to show up and give us a much more uh, detailed explanation regarding the Liberty Tree. So I'm very grateful for your generosity and with your time coming here and talking to us and talking to the people on cable. Uh, we're all looking very much forward to it. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Willie Wilson to begin our program. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here. I was here in September of 2018, and it's always nice to be um, invited back, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm delighted for this opportunity. Um, what I want to do today is I'm going to uh, share some slides, and so before we start talking about um, the Liberty Tree, I want to talk about um, uh, our, our place and time. So if we could go to the first slide, please. So this first slide, uh, what, what I want to do is talk about uh, uh, Brockton. Uh, and anytime I talk uh, as a history teacher, uh, we always want to give reference to uh, what we were before. And, um, and so one of the things that's fascinating about Brockton is uh, we, uh, the Native Americans who were here, the Wampanoags, they called this Setucket. Randolph was uh, um, uh, Cachado. There were Indian names for most of the municipalities around. And this is Sachem Rock. Uh, so what, what I want to say is uh, what we're doing is, you know, this is East Bridgewater. There's Sachem Rock. And Sachem Rock is actually the place where uh, the communities that represent Brockton and the surrounding towns was purchased by Miles Standish and uh, uh, from Sachem, Massasoit. So the, it was actually 373 years ago, March 23rd, when the deal was consummated. And it included seven miles land, seven miles in each direction, west, east, north, and south. And, uh, and so this particular uh, site is just remarkable. Now, most people have been to Plymouth Rock. And uh, Plymouth Rock is, is, you know, a lot of friends of mine from um, uh, abroad and from within the country, they're so disappointed when they see it. But this, <laughs> but because it's so small, it's been chipped away. But uh, if you have not been to Sachem Rock, which is in East Bridgewater, that's where the deal, it's huge. It's a huge outcrop of stone. Anybody been there? Uh, oh, yes, it's just, it's, it, and so when you're there on that promontory, it's just like you can imagine as a history person, uh, you know, Miles Standish and Constance Southworth and the others and Sachem Massasoit, it's just very impressive. So what I want to do is I want to share a few slides with that before we get to uh, the business of the Liberty Tree. That I do want to mention um, a little bit about the tree and the Underground Railroad status. Uh, one of uh, Brockton's Underground Railroad station was located at Frederick Douglass Avenue, formerly known as High Street, and in the uh, Edit e, Edward E. Bennett stables, Edward Eels Bennett. And Edward Eels Bennett was a hotel and stable keeper, hotel manager and stable keeper, and, uh, 
and I'm going to show you some slides about that. But what's so fascinating is he uh, uh, was what we call a radical Republican. He was a radical Republican, and he was a radical abolitionist. And, uh, and he himself was so, as a, as a person, was so admired by the community and, and so driven um, in the cause of anti-slavery. And we're going to talk about that. And, and there's a difference between a radical abolitionist and an abolitionist. An abolitionist is a person who believed that slavery was wrong and it should be done away with. But a radical abolitionist, which was Edward Eels Bennett, believed that not only is slavery wrong, but African Americans should have the same rights as whites. And so that's the difference, and that's why he made such an impact. Uh, now, the, we know the sycamore tree, which is the liberty tree, was planted in 1763. And it abutted the stables, and it became a staging point for orators who invade against the lack of freedom experienced by African Americans and women. Uh, descendants of Mr. Bennett's extended family discovered his letters in an attic trunk, which revealed the history of this underground railroad site. Anne and Harry Chase took the letters to their Brockton High School social studies teacher, Pauline Hoyt, who then contacted the Brockton Historical Society. The Brockton High School class of 1959, Harry's class, dedicated a plaque to commemorate this site with a list of its most prominent speakers. We had William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Parker Pillsbury, Amelia Bloomer, Dr. Mary Walker, Lucy Stone, Lucretia Mott, Harry B. Blackwell, and Frederick Douglass. So I, I want to mention, it's, it's, it's important to this, uh, what happened was uh, Mrs. Chase who in, in 2004, she was 93 years old, she lived at Nielsen uh, Apartments on the south side of the city, and she actually uh, uh, discovered the trunk. So we have Edward Eels Bennett, who had one son, um, Edward Eels Bennett Jr. And, and so when Edward Eels Bennett died, the son and the mother lived together, and, and then the mother died, and Edward Eels Bennett Jr. took all of the things that his father had and put them in a trunk, and then he left for many years, and so it went to the Chase family, and they, they didn't bother because they figured he would come back, and then he passed away, and they opened the trunk, and that's why we have a lot of the information about Edward Eels Bennett. So that was 2004. Now, uh, he uh, was very driven. He was very involved. He, uh, the, at the time, the North Bridgewater Gazette, that's what, what Brockton was before it became Brockton, uh, featured all of these different speakers, abolitionist speakers and others. And over the time, the tree became a symbol of all that matter. Uh, now, right now, there was a plaque. Now, what happened at the time when the Chase children approached their social studies teacher, uh, they approached then the historical society and they weren't interested. So the students themselves, the teacher and the students, paid money to get a plaque put on the tree. I have to uh, uh, say that the, the plaque that you see now is literally uh, the fourth uh, edition. Uh, read it, because what happened is over time people would steal the plaque. So the, this fourth one we have is embedded in a huge boulder. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so the plaque, the current plaque we have, uh, was placed in a boulder in uh, December 13, 2004, after a 45-year struggle to preserve the tree. And as curator for the Brockton Historical Society, we had Arnold's Arboretum in Boston. We tried to save the tree. Uh, Security Federal, which was the bank on Legion Parkway, was concerned of liability because the tree was so old it was rotting in the center. Uh, and so we had to have it, uh, we had to have it removed. Cross slices of the tree were preserved with a special epoxy adhesive, and then the tops of the wood were planned and sanded with 10 coats of lacquer sprayed by finished slabs. 
what happened is students uh, at Brockton, uh, at uh, Southeastern Vocational Technical High School, treated the tree, and, um, and we have two slices, one at the main library and one at the Brockton Historical Society. Each slab weighs approximately 150 pounds and measures 44 inches in di diameter. And uh, I always like to mention the, uh, the students involved in the project included Scott Eastler, Josh Wright, Joseph Mason, all of Brockton, Courtney Good of West Bridgewater, and Christo Clough of Norton. Instructors in the cabin cabinetry making department who developed the dial system to hold the sections together were Mr. Joseph Mark, Ronald Bissett, and Edward Perry. And if you haven't seen the slice, like I said, the, the tree was planted 1763, and these slices, the treatment, and I would always have, uh, particularly high school students and even my university students, just, just see the tree. But the tree became a symbol for all those things. And so, uh, you know, some of the people will ask, well, uh, Professor, what was Brockton like? What was the town of North Bridgewater like in the 1840s? And people don't realize most of the people in, uh, in North Bridgewater at the time, uh, they were not uh, interested about in slavery. They did not, they were not abolitionists because at that time Brockton was developing in the shoe manufacture and other allied businesses. And so they had quite a business with uh, Southern plantation owners as well as uh, in the Caribbean with England. And they used to make special shoes called uh, uh, Braden shoes, which were used uh, for the slaves, and so they would be reused and so forth. So they were just looking at it from an economic standpoint, and they were not, you know, they really weren't interested. And over time, as the abolitionist movement gan uh, gained more force, then they became more interested. And in fact, most people don't realize, but in the election of 1860, uh, uh, Massachusetts, only 63% of those who voted, voted for Lincoln. And so what we see is this, this, this whole thing with abolitionists, it, it, it grows gradually to the point where people are more sympathetic. So we come back to the tree. The tree itself is, uh, we, we tried to save it, we couldn't, and so we had it removed. And then what happened, there was an offshoot, we cloned it, we planted three other uh, planting, uh, what we call seedlings in the city that took. And th at the original site, uh, uh, off-growth started growing again. And, uh, and so it was, it was very emotional uh, because when we had to have the tree cut down, there was actually uh, what we call a requiem for the tree. We had a prayer service. We had a pastor. And... Uh, I didn't realize uh, how important it was uh, to people. And so particularly some of the seniors in the city, and, uh, and so the tree just had, it was a symbol, but it just had, it took on greater proportions um, than I anticipated. Okay, and this is an actual, now what's different here is uh, Miles Standish, along with the other colonists, actually purchased the land, unlike Plymouth. So, and it explains here in terms of what was exchanged. Uh, next one, this is at the site in East Bridgewater. And then here you can see, uh, you can see the, uh, the city seal. And, and so Sachem Rock is right there, 1649, like I said, uh, 373 years uh, this past March 23rd when the deal was transacted. And then it says, the area was settled in 1700, but actually that's, it's 1697 when we had some of the white settlers who settled in there, but they said 1700. A town, uh, the town of North Bridgewater, uh, 1821. Now between 1700 and 1821, actually we were North Parish, North Precinct, and then a, a town, uh, you know, established by the Massachusetts legislature in 1821. And then what's not represented in the, uh, the city seal, 1874, we become Brockton. We're still a town, but it's Brockton. Then 1881, we're incorporated as a city. As a city. And then you see uh, the, uh, the symbols, education, industry, and progress. 
Okay, next slide. And this is the outcrop in East Bridgewood. That's what I'm saying. It's just, it's so impressive. If you haven't had a chance to, to go out there, uh, it's just, it's really beautiful. Next one. And this shows you all of the Bridgewaters, you know, uh, and uh, from an old map. Next. Now, I did want to mention, um, this is so important, uh, because we have a situation where this is, this is from a uh, deed in 1744, uh, September of 1744, and Scipio, he's our first person of color here in Plymouth County, and he owned two lots of land. One uh, was on the west side, currently the site of uh, the VA hospital, and the other on the east side, not too far from the Downey School. And this is from the records, uh, from a list of the rates made out of the, by the assessors, September 14, 1744, for the payment of, uh, for Reverend John Porter's salary, Scipio, colored, <coughs> Uh, one pound, go back please, one pound, three shillings, and nine pence. And so we have maps of, of the area, 1738, 1750, 1830, 1868, and so we were able to track that. Next one. And the, the reason why I showed that is because, uh, and we can see Scipio's land here, at this 17, this is a, a 1750 map overlaid with a 1970 map. And the reason why it's so significant is because even though there was slavery, there's slavery in the North, but we did have free men and free women of color who still lived in what was now Brockton. But he's our earliest person that we've been able to uh, uh, research and validate. Next slide. This is the actual house uh, of uh, in, in house in uh, estate of Edward Eels Bennett, which was on High Street, which is now Frederick Douglass Avenue, and that's the sycamore tree in the front. And what you can't see, and I have a slide that's coming up shortly, but this is the actual house and boarding house, the residence and the boarding house. Um, next one. Now here you can see. We're looking that, that those are the stables. So the house would be to the to the left, and then you can see right to the left the, the uh, outcropping of the tree. Uh, this was taken in a, a circa 18, uh, 1870s, and this is High Street, uh, and we're looking at the Bixby block is there. And if you continued further up, that would be uh, you would come up to where the current the old high school is. Next one. This is a picture of Edward Eels Bennett as a young man. And uh, we see him, this picture, we don't know who the painter was, but this lies in the, uh, uh, the second story, second floor of the Brockton Public Library. Next one. And this is him as an older man. He was also a, a friend of uh, Thomas Alva Edison. And that's another story in terms of how Brockton became a laboratory for Edison. Brockton had the first electrically powered theater in the, uh, in the nation, first electrically powered uh, uh, fire station, first electrically powered resident on, uh, on Green Street, uh, Mayor Whipple's house. Uh, and so they were, they were friends. And that, I think that's another reason because of their friendship that Edison decided to use uh, Brockton as a laboratory. Next one. And here is the, this is the first plaque. Like I told you, I think we, we've gone through, I think this is the fourth one. No one can get this one out because the bold is really, it's, it's encased and <laughs> you can't take the bold. But, uh, and, and it commemorates those people I mentioned earlier. Next slide. Okay, and here is a, a picture showing the, uh, the Underground Railroad routes and uh, and of course, uh, Brockton, uh, which was North Bridgewater, uh, we, have, we have several different stations, uh, but that just gives you an idea. Next slide. Frederick Douglass is the most famous of the people who spoke at the Liberty Tree. And as some of you know, Frederick Douglass lived uh, 
in, uh, in New Bedford, but he also lived for uh, a few years in Lynn. And uh, this is a, a book by Thomas Dalton, excellent book if you get a chance to, to get it. It talks about his, uh, his life during the Lynn years. He actually wrote his first, he started write, writing his first uh, biography in Lynn before he moved to uh, Rochester, New York. Next one. And that's uh, Frederick Douglass as an older person. Next. In uh, 1987, on the Historical Commission, we struck, we had a coin made, uh, and uh, that we called it the Sycamore Tree. We were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. And, uh, and this is just a, a depiction of that. Next. Now, uh, what's so important is when you talk about and you hear about the Underground Railroad, they, you hear about men. And, it, you know, and what happens is there are many women, white and black, who were very, very, very uh, powerful and contributed to the success of the Underground Railroad. One of those was Harriet Tubman. Next one. And Lucretia Mott, who actually visited the site, was very involved uh, in the Underground Railroad. And, and what people don't realize, you could not, uh, when these people were running away from slavery, they had nothing with them. So all along the stations of the Underground Railroad, the conductors had to meet with people. And, and uh, a lot of these women, they, they had quilting parties and, and did other things to help support these people while they were staying. And uh, it meant feeding them, lodging them, uh, making clothes for them. Um, if some were injured, giving them the medicines of the time and that kind of thing. Next one. And this is uh, Frederick Douglass's wife, Anna Murray, his first wife. Uh, next one. Sojourner Truth. Next one. Uh, this is uh, some of the posters. Now, one of the things that uh, when we talk about the Underground, Ra Underground Railroad and the Freedom Tree, one of the things that uh, people don't realize, Boston was the place for uh, African Americans. As some of you know, the very first black community in Boston was where currently uh, uh, the uh, uh, Little Italy is. You know, basically, when you came into the port, they used to call that uh, Guinea, New Guinea, after Africa, because that was the, the first black community. Then they moved further up, and so they were on the southern slope of Beacon Hill. And then uh, they moved from there to the south end, and then from the south end to Roxbury and so forth. But there was, the, uh, there was such uh, a fervor and support for both uh, uh, runaway slaves as well as the, uh, the free people of color that lived in Boston. This is just an example. Uh, one of the things in New Bedford, uh, we did have, uh, after the passage of the uh, Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, uh, the South, uh, actually, well, we'll talk about that later on, but one, one of the things is you, you federal marshals could come on behalf of southern plantation owners and take uh, runaway slaves back to slavery. And the law was abused in that free African-American men and women were also uh, taken off the street and, and enslaved. Um, you might have seen 12 Years as a Slave of writ written that account by Solomon Northrop. Uh, next one. So these are just examples in terms of this is what I want you to understand is this is what changed the minds of a lot of people in, in North Bridgewater and the North in general who were on the side of should, should slaves be free or not. You know, here it was an economic thing because of the shoe industry, but eventually more and more people said it's wrong. And, the, and then they were getting these firsthand accounts like Fred, from Frederick Douglass and others who were now writing their accounts of what they were experiencing in the South. Whereas the, the Southern plantation owners would say, oh, no, they're happy. No, we don't do that. That's a lie. So as, as, as the uh, North Bridgewater Gazette and other newspapers, the Liberator by uh, um, others started publishing the, the actual stories. Next one. And we, now we're in uh, New Bedford. And Frederick Douglass, when he escaped from Maryland, he went to New York City. From New York City, he went to uh, Rhode Island. And then from Rhode Island, 
he and his wife went to New Bedford. So New Bedford, he lived in New Bedford for a time. Next slide, please. And this is where he stayed. The building is still there in New Bedford. Next. And now we come to, uh, there are many, many people who use the, the Underground Railroad to escape slavery. And one of the most famous is, of course, William and Ellen Craft. And the reason why it's so significant for us is because uh, a lot of the slaves, when they're coming up, when they, they, they would get to Connecticut and then Rhode Island, and then they would be, the way the roots were, they might be in Middleborough or Taunton and then, or Bridgewater, and then they would go to Boston. Bridgewater, North Bridgewater, Boston. And the Tory House, which is in Bridgewater, I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's one of the older buildings right in the center of Bridgewater, built, um, I want to say, 1768. But that was one of the Underground Railroad stations as well. It's still standing. It's a private residence. And William and Ellen Craft, oh, no, go, go to the next one. They actually were, they stayed in Bridgewater on their way to Boston, where they lived in Boston for a time. Um, and we can see here the line drawings of William and Ellen Craft uh, to be found William Stills, The Underground Railroad, published in 1872. The Crafts and, uh, used disguises to escape from Georgia to Boston. William Craft later wrote back, running a thousand miles of freedom. And then the book is good. It's, a, it's, a, it's one account of their uh, travels and escape from from slavery. That's his wife. She was disguised. She was very fair-skinned. So she was disguised as a white gentleman uh, who is going north for some medical treatment, and he was her slave or servant. And that's how, uh, that's how they engineered their escape. Next one. Now, uh, that's one account, but I always tell people this is the Underground Railroad account by William Stills. This was 1872, and it has a count. He kept all the records because he was worked for the Underground Railroad. So uh, they, people were very fearful, and he hid the records. So the records were survived. After slavery, he wrote the accounts. It's a, it's a really fascinating collection. Uh, I think the best of all, you know, as a composite of the tales of these men and women who used the Underground Railroad. Next one. And these are just some of the books. Next one. That are available if you're interested in reading more about the railroad. Next one. Thank you. Next. And of course, Frederick Douglass, who is Frederick Douglass, in, in my opinion, he's my favorite American. There are many, many famous Americans, but he's, you know, if you, uh, this is, a, this is a David Blight's book, which won the Pulitzer Prize in history a few years ago, um, but uh, just a great, great person, Frederick Douglass. Next one. Forbidden Fruit by uh, Betty Duramis. Next one. Another book by her. Okay, oh, go right here. All right, so now we're at a point where uh, we are planning, the city is planning to do a lot of work in that area, and I wanted to share with you uh, some pictures of what uh, what the city is planning for a park. Next one. Okay, so here is uh, they're planning. Next, yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, a view of the park entrance. So uh, we're looking. This is looking from uh, Frederick Douglass Avenue, I guess, toward Legion Parkway. Next. And this is the view from Legion Parkway looking toward Frederick Douglass Avenue. Next. I want to call your attention to the city seal again. <laughs> I hope you, when you see that seal and you drive down Southworth Street and so forth, you'll reflect. This is another view. Next. And now uh, that's my last slide. Now, um, what I want to do now is uh, to, to talk just a little bit more about uh, the um, uh, the situation in terms of the Underground Railroad, and I because I love coming here. One of the reasons why I love it because I I, I have a chance to uh, entertain questions from the audience. Now, one of the things I I skipped over something because this is uh, really really critical, and um, 
And I, I just want people to remember, because it, it comes up in my history classes sometime, too, you know, in terms of the, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Now, uh, the advantages for the North, for the, cause, because a lot of people say, well, why did, why did Congress agree to this? Why did they do this? You know, so here are the advantages. And, and one of the things that I always learned in school, remember, California came in as a free state. That was a biggie at the time. So it was a, it was a compromise. The advantages for the North, disputed Texas, Texas territory would be turned over to New Mexico. So that, that was one piece. The slave trade would be abolished in the District of Columbia. That's the second piece. And then the biggie, California would be admitted as a, as a free state. Now those were the three major advantages for the North. For the South, Texas would be given $10 million as compensation by the federal government. Texas would remain a slave state. Secondly, slavery would still be permitted in the District of Columbia. Furthermore, a new strict Fugitive slave law was passed. See, this is, this is, these are the benefits for the South. Now, the slave trade would be abolished, but slavery, so you couldn't trade in slaves, but slavery would still be allowed in the District of Columbia. And the third for the South, the remainder of the territory ceded by Mexico would be formed into the territories of New Mexico and Utah and slaves could be brought into these territories. So all along, the, you know, people have to understand, they, they, you know, I think the Congress was trying to prevent the Civil War. So they were making these, comp you know, these concessions all along, and of course, it, it, eventually it didn't work. But that's, that's, that's the background in terms of the tree. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, I mentioned the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, we had uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published in 1852. Uh, slaves and black people in the South, one man went to a, a Georgia penitentiary for 10 years for having a copy. Uh, then you have the Kansas-Nebraska uh, Act, 1854. Those of you, uh, history buffs, 1855, 1856, bleeding Kansas, fighting in terms of slave or free. Uh, and then 1856, uh, the caning, the caning of uh, Charles Sumner in, 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 uh, in Congress. And uh, this is, this is uh, uh, one of the things that even as a, as a high school student, even before I got to college, uh, Charles Sumner was caned by Congressman Preston Brooks, who was a nephew of Senator Andrew Butler. He was beaten with a heavy cane until the stick shattered. Charles Sumner's bloody and unconscious uh, body suffered uh, damage. He had damage to his brain and spine. Uh, it was three and a half years before he returned um, to Congress. Instead of being jailed, Brooks was acclaimed a hero in the South. And you talk about partisan. Uh, he was sent hundreds of new canes, some with gold and silver heads. One with the inscription, hit him again. So this shows you in terms of people saying we're divisive and partisan now. I mean, to be caned, he suffered permanent brain and spinal Damage. And as some of you know, on the Black History Trail in Boston, you can actually go by Sumner's house. That's part of the, uh, the Freedom Trail. Uh, then we had 1857, Dred Scott. Okay? And here, you know, we, again, you know, he was declared not a citizen. 1859, Harper's Ferry. And, uh, and uh, John Brown. Um, and, and we have a situation there, and John Brown, as some of you know, he lived for a uh, some time in Springfield, Massachusetts. And, uh, and then, um, you know, so we have all these things of, of making people in North Bridgewater and other towns saying, you know, this is, this is really wrong. Too many, this is wrong. What's happening? You know, um, and, and so you see the change growing more and more and more against slavery. And, at first, abolitionists were considered wackos. And then later on, as these events transpired, 
you know, average citizens were saying, this is wrong, you know. And so I just want you to know that it took time, and the abolitionists finally get, you know, garnered more and more support and more votes. Um, and I think at, at this point, um, I'd like to end my presentation and entertain questions from the audience. Thank you very much. This is uh, this is new. Uh, as of uh, three weeks, because two things that where the tree is is not um, it's not public property. It's private property. So what the uh, the mayor's office has been dealing with the owner and and so uh, uh, from what I understand with Mr. Mays and everything, it's 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 going forward. These are preliminary plans and I was so excited. So, you know, we have, there's actually uh, the tree and then where this park is going and further down the street, we have the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association where there's a, 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 again, privately owned land that we've cleared students from Brockton High, Stonehill College and others. We have a garden we do a, every year, the reading of uh, Frederick Douglass's speech um, uh, and uh, we do that in June and I'm hoping everyone will participate when they hear about it, but we've been doing it for 12 years. The unique uh, aspect about our speech reading is we're the only city in the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts where the speech is read in different languages. So it's read by uh, uh, different people from the community in Lithuanian, um, Mandarin Chinese, uh, French, uh, Vietnamese, Italian, it's just, it's just really wonderful. So uh, that has garnered a lot of support. That's, but um, we, I don't know the current status, but it's, 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 it's planned. In fact, I, I had to get permission to get these slides. <laughs> this is the, no, I, I figured you haven't, because they just were released uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, and I had to get permission, and uh, they waited a day, and then I got the clearance. So. <laughs> But what the good part about that is it's going to really help develop. And, and I, I do want to say uh, Legion Parkway was one of the first urban renewal projects in the country. So before that, it was a, it was a Irish slum with no running water. It was Patty's Lane. That's what they called it. So once Legion Parkway was done in the 1920s and finished, it was really uh, uh, what people don't realize. Um, you know, I heard from my grandparents and, you know, but people from the surrounding towns, Brockton was the place to be. It was the place to be. It was, you know, you had about 14 uh, movie theaters. They called it the Great White Way. People from all over, you could get on a trolley in Brockton and go all the way to New York City. You know, you just made changes. It was an exciting place. And so for the immigrant community here, we had 105 different factories, shoe factories and allied industries. So, you know, uh, a lot of the families that came up, former slaves came here and worked as coachmen and were able to build new homes. I mean, there was such opportunity. And after uh, uh, interviewing several senior citizens, I said, was there ever any friction? What, you know, and they said, uh, Saturday and Sunday, people were in church. There were jobs for everyone. So there was just this, you know, this heyday. I call it the golden age, particularly from 1880 to 1925. I ended at 1925 because at that point, some of the, the shoe barons were very, very philanthropic. They gave money back to the city. They sponsored all kinds of things. Uh, and so, you know, once the, the unions came in and then the shoe barons changed, you know, and there was a change in the country. And, and so, you know, uh, what happened is, you know, the shoe industry went to Europe and South, and that, became, that began the demise. But please, uh, questions, questions. Don't, don't, uh, anybody? Comments? Yes. Is there anything left of the Liberty Tree up, um, by Frederick Douglass Park now? Yes. So what happened is, uh, I, in fact, uh, Min was able to get a picture of what it looks now. That's the new offshoot. It's actually a tree 
Oh, who was it? Oh, Sean, I'm sorry. Sean was able to get it. And so you actually have another tree growing. And, 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 and when the tree was taught, a lot of people said, uh, particularly in the minority community, they were very angry. They said, there's nothing wrong with this tree. It was, it was rotted in the center. But when you look at, for example, this is an offshoot from the original tree, and you see no rot. But the center of the tree was rotting. And as I said before, it was planted in 1763. So I can, you know, because I had my doubts too. But once we had to have it removed, a wonderful company out of Stoughton, Maltby uh, Construction, they removed it. And so we, they asked us as part of the Historical Society, what do you want to do with these healthy limbs? And we, we had several of them placed in the Grayson Hotel. And I said, we want to keep those, you know. So that's why we, it's so important you have in your lobby a picture. And then, and, and you know, um, there were people when the tree came down, several citizens were there. And I told you we had a, a minister and there was a prayer and, and people were crying. You know, and I, and I didn't realize that the, the symbolism was so great. And, you know, and, and, and for old time Brocktonians, they, it wasn't just anti-slavery women's rights in the 1920s, people were meeting there. I mean, so the tree was a focal point for anything during the Vietnam era, you know. So like, it was like freedom. This is what freedom is. Freedom is important. This tree represents, it's a symbol of freedom, you know. And so it, it, I was surprised how, um, like I said, I was taken back, you know. I didn't realize what it meant to so many people. So that's, that's why we keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's so nice that the uh, Plymouth County District Attorney's Office validates the history, validates the, uh, the, the sentiments, and, um, and, you know, I think it's just reflective of uh, appreciation for our heritage. Good questions. Come on, come on. There must be more. Oh, but I have to pick on somebody. Where's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, he's, I don't see Mr. Savignano. He must have slipped out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how, Professor, yeah. How, long, how long was the Underground Railroad like in operation? And how many people used that you know, method to get out of the South? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> now, what happened is everybody thinks of the Underground Railroad as 1840s to the end of slavery. But it actually, the Underground Railroad proceeds, precedes that by many years. The Underground Railroad actually started in the 1600s. Uh, what happened was uh, we had before slavery, before 1619 in Virginia, we had indentured servants. And so you would, you would pay for amount of indentured. So we had you know, Irishmen, Scotchmen, they would pay for service. At the end of their seven years or 10 years, they would be free. And usually whoever they worked for would give them a parcel of land and some tools, and they would go off. But once slavery became legal, uh, and African slaves were, you know, you had runaway, let's go back a little bit. You had runaway slaves, both white and African. and you would, you know, the owners would run into the hinterland to get them but, uh, and, they, and bring them back. But what happened is some of them would go to the, remember we only have 13 colonies, so the frontier is the hinterland. So the Native Americans, that was the first, that, that was the Underground Railroad. These people who were enslaved or indentured that wanted to get away, they would go into the frontier to the Native Americans, and they would, they would stay there. So first of all, the, that's where it starts. That's the Underground Railroad. You no longer want to, you know, you make friends with the Native Americans, the indigenous population, and you stay there. And that's why there was so much intermarriage amongst African Americans. Once, the, once slavery was legalized, and here in the Commonwealth, that was 1649, you now, because you don't have to worry if you, it's, it's not white, it's black. You can tell by the color of their skin. So now it's making it more difficult to run away, and the indigenous population, the Native Americans, still took them. So that was, that precedes up until the 1840s, when now we have a group 
the Quakers. 1688, the Quakers came, they, they, they uh, made a proclamation that slavery is immoral, it's illegal, it's against God. So they became, when we think of the, uh, the, the quilts and uh, the Underground Railroad, a lot of people think Quaker because they, because of their faith, uh, invested money and assisted in terms of the various stations. But they always worked with the black community. So, but, but most of the time when you hear of Underground Railroad, people think of you know, William Lloyd Garrison and others. But there were free blacks who worked along with them. So we have a, a phase where it's just indigenous in terms of runaways. And then the formalized Underground Railroad from the 1840s. Very good question. Anyone else? Good, good. Well, it's always good to come. I, I, I enjoy coming back. Uh, like I said, I was here uh, 2018 in September, and it's and you're still in office? <laughs> oh, so you, you did a great job. So I, I just want to thank you very much for once again coming here and enlightening all of us on, you know, really the history of Brockton. It really is interesting. It's interesting to me as somebody from the area, and like I told you earlier, my grandparents we're making shoes here 100 years ago. Mm. And so to hear the development of Brockton up through that and then where it is now, and you go down Montello Street and you see a lot of those buildings that were used to be the shoe factories and on the other, on the other side over there, uh, it's, it's interesting to, I think, the people, especially if you grew up and you had family members here. So yeah. thank you so much. This was, oh, thank this was you. Wonderful. Thank you for having and me. I, and I have a certificate of appreciation for you, Professor, um, to, from the Plymouth DA's office, with serious appreciation and deepest gratitude for your generosity and your wisdom in preserving the history of the city of Brockton as an important stop in the Underground Railroad. Thank you for sharing the significance of our Brockton's Liberty Tree with our office and the residents of Plymouth County. And it's from the DA's office. And I just thank you so oh, much thank for you. coming here today and taking the time out for you. I really thank you. It. Thank you for thank having you so me. Much. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And we hope you're over here the rest of the good day. Thanks so much.